I don't know what can be more important than struggling for peace, working for justice and equality. It's so important. This is, I think, sacred work. But in all honesty, it, it took me a long time to get on that road. Growing up, we all come from our own experiences. We're not, for most of us, we're not born peacemakers. We're highly influenced by where we grow up and people in our family and friends. But in that little town in Louisiana that, that, that's home, a little town of 3,000, we were cut off from a bigger world. Loving in so many ways, hardworking folks, but our greatest enemy there and throughout the world is often ignorance. Ignorance and fear. We didn't question our country's government. We didn't question our church's teachings. Very submissive. I went to 12 years of segregated schools. Worshipped in the Catholic Church where the last five years were reserved for our black sisters and brothers. And I cannot recall anyone in our town, not a priest, a teacher, a parent, the macho football coaches, a student, myself included, who dare to say we have a problem here. It's called racism. What I remember so well are the mantras, it is our tradition. Segregation is our tradition. We are separate, we said, but equal, really. Kind of reminds me of the Catholic Church's teaching when it comes to women's ordination today. They say it is our tradition that only males can be ordained. Men and women are equal, they say, but they have different roles. Let's call it by its right name, sexism. And racism, like sexism, like homophobia, and all other forms of discrimination, it's wrong. And no matter how hard we may try to justify discrimination against others because of their race, gender, or sexual orientation, in the end, it is never the way of our Creator, our loving God, who created all of us equal, of equal worth and dignity. No exceptions, no exceptions. My ticket out of Louisiana was the military. When I left college with a degree in geology, it was during the days of Vietnam. I believed our leaders as many did. We had to go off to that war in Vietnam. Our cause was noble. We were going to be the liberators. And I volunteered. And in my fourth year in the military, thinking of making a career, I went off to Vietnam, as many of us did. And that became that turning point in my life. The violence, the suffering, the death of so many, especially the children, the civilians who are the majority of the casualties in war. Losing friends, wounded there, death was close. And I remember my faith became more important. God became closer. But a big inspiration in my life became this Catholic priest. Whenever I saw a priest, I usually turned around and went the other way. <laughs> but this guy, an old priest from Quebec, from Canada, he had been a missionary in Bolivia for many years. He was nearby at this orphanage, caring for over 300 children whose parents had been killed by our bombs, by our guns. And this was an orphanage. There, there were many throughout the country. And he was the first real peacemaker and healer that I ever met. 
his whole life was about giving, trying to relieve the suffering of others. He wasn't trying to convert these children who were Buddhist or trying to make them into his religion. For him, it was about love, equality, peace. And that's something there that I said, I, I want to try to just live out in my own life, not knowing where that would go, if that's possible. I wanted to try it. And I came home, it was so good to be back home with family and friends in the bayous of Louisiana. And then I entered this missionary order, the Merino order, uh, directed to Merino by this army chaplain. When I said, I don't know where to go with this, he said, try out the Merino community. And I said, Mary who? <laughs> <laughs> and so I arrived at the Merino seminary. It was a, a new beginning. I was filled with hope. I'd lost my hope in Vietnam. And that's what war does, it kills hope. I was later ordained now, six years later, 1972, and assigned to our mission work in Bolivia, where this slum barrio on the outskirts of La Paz became my home for the next five years. It was here where the poor really, they became my teachers. They really, help educate this gringo that knew nothing about their culture, their struggle. It angered me to see my country, the United States, in Bolivia and in nearby Chile, Argentina, and throughout Central America supporting dictators. We were there like the new conquistadors protecting our economic interests, exporting those vast natural resources the tin, the copper, the oil, and we were exploiting the cheap labor where you can pay a worker a dollar a day and get away with it. It was in Bolivia where I was introduced to this theology of liberation that gives hope to the poor, that does not give that theology that I grew up with, you know, just be silent, accept your lot in life, whatever it is, and look forward to the next <laughs> where your joy would come. Now, this theology talks about a loving God who does not want anyone to go to bed hungry at night. Wants everyone to receive a just wage for their labor. When your children are sick, there should be medicines for them, a school to go to, adequate house and running water. And the vast majority in Bolivia and throughout the developing world today, as we know, they don't have access to the basics in life. They, they see their children die before their time. And they do what you and I do if we were living under those conditions. We will say basta, enough. And they are empowered by this loving God, calling them to the table as equals, where no one at that table can say they are lesser than another and they begin to speak out. And out of that liberation theology comes this all-important word, solidaridad, solidarity, which simply means to, to walk with, to accompany others in their struggle, to make the struggle of others your struggle. And it was in my fifth year in trying to live that out, I was among the many arrested. But I had a passport. I was a U.S. citizen, a Catholic priest. And I was kicked out of the country. Friends were not that fortunate. Some were killed, many in prison, tortured. Many had to flee the country to save their lives. When I came back home, it was a very lonely time. I tried to get back. Visa denied. It was then that many of you may remember El Salvador was really in the news. Archbishop Oscar Romero in this little country, El Salvador, was assassinated, shot while singing mass. Why? Because he dared to use his voice and his power for the poor. He 
He said to them, to the military, stop the killing. He wrote to our president then, Jimmy Carr, stop sending that military aid a million dollars a day to our military that are killing us. Stop, he said, in the name of God. Stop. He didn't stop. The killing continued. Months later, four church women, three nuns, a Catholic lay worker, two from Cleveland, and two of our very old sisters were raped and killed by the Salvadoran military. Many of you remember that. Many of us knew the women. And we went back, we went to El Salvador to try and find out how this could possibly happen. We found our country deeply involved there, giving guns to those doing the killing. It wasn't complicated. What was going on was being done in our name, with our tax money. We came back from El Salvador. We couldn't keep quiet. As we know, silence, when there is an injustice, silence is consent. Silence is that voice of complicity. And when we learned that 525 Salvadoran soldiers were now starting their training at Fort Benning down in Georgia, we said, not in our name. And a small group of us went there to protest. And three of us decided, after a couple of weeks, in the name of the people of El Salvador, especially the many martyrs, that we would go on to the post at night dressed as high-ranking army officers. And we had with us this powerful boom box. And it was the last sermon of Bishop Romero that he gave in the cathedral the day before he was killed. It was his plea to the military saying to them, stop the killing. Lay down your weapons, he said. Disobey your superior officers telling you to kill your fellow campesinos. And obey a higher law, that law of God that says, thou shalt not kill. We can speak for hours about this prophet, Oscar Romero, the martyr of the faith, who will be in two weeks beatified as a true martyr of the church. It was the next day he was killed. And he had his words sent to us, my friends, a tape. And so we entered at night, dressed three of us as high-ranking army officers. We went near the barracks where the house, Salvador's were housed. We scaled this tall pine tree. And when the last lights went out, we said, Bishop Romero, this is for you, brother. And his voice boomed into the barracks, stop killing, lay down your weapons. We saw this as a very sacred moment. The army didn't quite see it that way. <laughs> they came out of the barracks with their M16s, their German shepherds spotted us in the tree. It was, they said, you come down or we're going to shoot you down. It was time to come down. <laughs> but we left the boom box up there, the message. <laughs> repeating the message of Bishop Romero and make sure they got it. We were brought to trial, arrested, went to jail, and then to court. And old Maximum Bob, the judge down there, who sent Dr. King and civil rights leaders to jail, didn't like protesters, didn't like us. And he sent us to prison for a year and a half. the best retreat I've ever been on. <laughs> Linda Ventimiglia, our co-conspirator, and Larry Rosebaum and I, we, we were, we felt at peace. We knew why we were there. It was all about solidarity, a, a humble act of solidarity. We got out of prison and joined tens of thousands, many from Rochester, Syracuse, 
throughout the country trying to stop that military aid to El Salvador. The killing continued, but I must confess, we couldn't stop it. It got worse. Massacre after massacre, El Musulti, over 800 killed, including over 200 children. And then, November the 16th, 1989, they went after the Jesuits, a well-known group of priests who had a university in San Salvador. They had been critical of the military. They got death threats. They refused to leave the country. And the military entered after midnight, dragged them out of their rooms, these six Jesuit priests. With them, a young mother, Elba, and her teenage daughter, Selena. They were all clear killed at close shot at close range. At the front pages of all newspapers. Members of Congress who kept supporting the military aid, some of them knew the Jesuits and uh, or were educated by the Jesuits at Georgetown or some high schools, Le Moyne College. Well, they went to investigate. They came back reporting that those who did the killing were trained at the U.S. Army School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia. And that's when I and a small group now of 10 of us, we went to Columbus, Georgia, home of Fort Benning, and we had a 35-day war-only fast, a hunger strike, to call attention to this issue through a fast, being very inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, and other great peacemakers. And after our fast, we had to get to work. We had to start doing some research. And through the Freedom of Information Act and helped along by Joe Mokley from Massachusetts, Joe Kennedy and others, and, and, and other members of Congress, we started to piece together the history of this school. It had been around since 1948. It had trained at that time over 50,000 soldiers from 20 countries of Latin America. They came here every year few thousand, all paid for by our tax money, hiding behind this wall of secrecy. It's incredible. Members of Congress, journalists did not know about the School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia. And that was not a coincidence. And we arrived. And we did our homework. And we was all documented. We knew enough. This school was well known in Latin America as a school of assassins on the Escuela de Asesinos, a school for dictators. General Bonzer from Bolivia, this brutal dictator who killed so many in Bolivia, inducted into the school's Hall of Fame. And then there was the New York Times front page, a school of torture. They discovered that there were manuals here being used to advocate torture. Most of the soldiers came here to learn this course, counterinsurgency warfare. Who were the insurgents, we asked? And what we learned, what so many knew, they are who they've always been the landless farmers who can't not make it anymore, who suffer so much, who begin to speak out for food for their children. They are the labor leaders, especially in Colombia, the religious leaders, like in El Salvador. They are the healthcare workers, anyone calling for land reform. They are the targets of those who were being trained at this school of assassins. When the United Nations documented that those who killed Bishop Romero raped and killed the church room and the Jesuits, and the list went on and on, that got a lot of publicity, we said it's time to open up an office in Washington, D.C., an SOA watch office, 
and I and others just started traveling. I, I stayed in this little apartment where I remain today, right outside of the main gate of Fort Benning. And um, we have to build a movement. There are no shortcuts, as you know. We gotta get on the road and live out of a suitcase. Our greatest enemy in this country is ignorance. We do not know very much about what our foreign policy is doing in so many countries, not only in Latin America. And we have to educate ourselves and others. We have to educate journalists, members of Congress and others, our family and friends. And as you know, it's a challenge. And the biggest challenge is to always do it in a loving and peaceful way. Not to let the anger consume us, to dominate us. We have to hold on to hope and joy. That's what we learned. We put the word out. It's gathered at the main gate every November, that weekend before Thanksgiving. Let us come in the name of solidarity and call for the closing of this school of assassins. Let us keep alive the memories of the thousands, the 75,000 killed in El Salvador, the 200,000 in Guatemala, and on and on and on. <laughs> Let us keep their memories alive. And while we started with 10, then 500 came, and then 1,000, and then 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. And when we gather, it's this big celebration of hope. I know so many of you perhaps have been with us. Could you please stand those who have been at our vigil, John, and so many others. Could you please stand those who have been down to Georgia? Our, our Veterans for Peace that I'm a member of. And in the early days, the Vets for Peace and the Nuns were the early the groups that came on at the very beginning. And it meant a lot. When we gather there, it's a very important time, very sacred time. A lot of speakers from Latin America, from the U.S., young and old, students and others, labor leaders. The United Auto Workers joined our cause. President of the United Auto Workers, Bob King, started bringing a lot of the members down because of so many labor leaders being killed by these graduates in places like Columbia. We had these great musicians that just uplift the spirit. Music, as you know, is such an important part of movements. It does something to us. That Saturday night, we were at the convention center. Lots of workshops, teach-ins, connecting to issues like the drones that many are working, as you know, in Syracuse, the drones. Immigration, just 30 minutes away, is a steward detention center, the largest in the country, about 1,800 undocumented there. 85% will be deported. We've been there to visit some of the inmates. Immigration is a big issue now in our movement. And other issues of discrimination. I remember college students from Oberlin College in Ohio in the early days joined our council. <clears throat> they were the visionaries, the college students. They reminded us that we've got to keep our focus on militarism, on closing the School of the Americas, but there are also issues that we must confront too. Issues of racism, they said, sexism, and homophobia. We've got to start making connections, and we've been trying to do that ever since. It became a tradition early on. Every year, there would be people who crossed the line, went on to Fort Benning. 
breaking the law there, but following the higher law that says thou shalt not kill with the law of conscience. And I'm happy to report that over 300 of our people have gone off to prison, most serving six month sentences. Are we getting a, a ring in this? Yeah. Yes. Um, move it, sorry. Move it, move it away from Is you. Is it too? Get away? Okay. Well, move, move, the move the mic away from you. Oh, that's yeah. it. Okay. That's it. How's that? Let me know if it's not, because I don't want to have problems with your ears there. Uh, but here is the situation. Over 300 have been arrested and went to prison. Uh, and I want to acknowledge what we call our prisoners of conscience. I know John has been a couple of times. But I want our prisoners of conscience to stand. John, others here who went to prison in the name of solidarity. Yes, our prisoner, anyone else? It was in Syracuse last night, there were like 12 who stood up. <laughs> Thank you. But anyways, we're gonna keep this. We're gonna be back in November. We're not going away. Keep, we're keeping like, Rockland, we, we're keeping our hands on the plow, like the Women's Ordination Conference. We're not going away. And there are signs of hope in our struggles. Years ago, we started to go to these countries with a strategy talk. We said, let us go and talk with their presidents, their indigenous leaders, their university leaders, and ask them to pull their troops out. And we've gone now to 17 different countries. We've met a lot of presidents. And I'm happy to report to you this evening that five countries have pulled their troops out. Those countries being Argentina, Venezuela, Bolivia. It was a joy getting back to Bolivia and seeing old friends there. That was number three. And then we went to Ecuador. And we met with President Rafael Correa. And at that meeting, he called a press conference and announced that Ecuador would no longer send troops there. And the last country to pull out was Nicaragua, where we went. And he spent many, many, many times there. Um, but he's such good white. But he said it very well when he said he was pulling the troops out. He's in Daniel Ortega. Of Nicaragua said this school should never have existed and we will no longer send our troops there. In October we're going on to and actually next month we'll be going to Mexico and then we're going to go on to Chile in October, Chile and Brazil. Whenever we get a country to pull out it's a home run for us. <laughs> you know, we celebrate a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Just recently, last month, we were actually in March, we were in El Salvador. And uh, we met with President Salim. He just doesn't have the power, good man. He's at the FMLN group that was, you know, the resistors, the gorillas in the mountains being killed. Well, he's president today, he was a school teacher. And uh, the Reina party, though, still has a lot of po uh, power. He won by less than 1%. He said it very clearly. He doesn't have the power that other presidents have to do that. But he encouraged us to keep working as he will work. And he encouraged us to keep working very hard on immigration because he said, we have over 2 million Salvadorans in your country. Before leaving, we went to this prison and visited five women who are about 17 women, so the last 17, who have been in prison now for seven years for having a miscarriage, a miscarriage. And they all told us this basically the same story, these five women we met with, who have been in now for seven years. They bled. They fainted. These are very poor women, Campesina women. Three of the five could not read or write. Two of the five were raped. 
And then they went to the hospital just weak from this miscarriage. The doctors questioned them and said, I don't believe you. They were handcuffed to the hospital bed. And when they got strong enough, they were brought to a judge. Told by an attorney, you cannot speak. It was hard to hear this. Women in our delegation listening to their stories had to leave. They wept. How can this be? <coughs> they have 22 more years to go. 22. And we said to these women before we left, we spent an hour and a half with them. We said, we are coming back to the United States and we will tell your stories to our people. We don't know about you. When I got back, it was the first delegation I came back from. We were so exhausted. We sleep so well that I could not sleep. Each of us who was on the delegation meeting with these women, we couldn't sleep. And recently we were in Washington for our days of action to lobby our members of Congress to close the School of the Americas. And six of us, with one of your own with John, we went to the Salvadoran Embassy in Washington, D.C. And we gave them a letter that we are here to use our voices and to stand in solidarity with Class 17, the women in prison. And we are going to sit here and we want you to do all you can to get your government to release these women. And the Secret Service called, they moved in, they gave us three warnings. If we didn't leave, they would arrest us. We wouldn't leave, we were arrested. We spent the next 30 hours in prison in the DC lockup. And May the 15th, we go before the judge for a status hearing. And um, then to court. I must say, if we go to prison, it will be an honor and a privilege to go on behalf of these women. Just before we went to the city in the, in the um, Salvadoran Embassy, two days before we did that, we weren't aware of it until later, Amnesty International went to El Salvador, two of their top staff people, and met with President Seren and gave President Seren over 300,000 signatures, a petition, calling for the release of these women. And our SOA Watch is a part of that now. Just go to our website, soaw.org, slash free last 17, our own petition, that we are going to deliver to the Salvadoran Embassy and later going to El Salvador to give it to the President. Check it out. Also, there's a very important article on our website. Just Google it. New York Times op-ed, March 2nd. El Salvador and La 17. This op-ed was written by Amnesty International. Very important. A few years ago, in addressing this for 25 years, I was really focused, as I still am, on the School of the Americas, now called the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. <laughs> focused in on that injustice in Latin America, especially Central America, like Rockland. As a Catholic priest a few years ago, I started meeting very devout Catholic women who took me aside after my talk about this injustice and said, you know, we got to talk. There is an injustice much closer to home in your church, in our church, the Catholic Church. Like you, they said to me, I am being called to the priesthood. And what I heard was so similar to what I experienced in this call. And what I heard kept me awake at night. And I began to ask why. It's amazing how we didn't question that during those many years in the seminary. And for 25 or 30 years as a priest, 
I mean, I, you know, others didn't question it, but now it's different. And I began to ask after having these long conversations with so many of these women, I began to ask a basic question, why, why wouldn't women be ordained? As Catholics and most people of faith, we declare, we say that God created men and women equal. Galatians 3.28 reminds us in the Holy Scriptures, there is neither male nor female. In Christ, you are one. But this is the one that really poked the beehive of patriarchy. The popes, bishops, all priests, we all say that this call to be a priest comes from God, not other than the Creator. So I began to ask, this is not heavy theology here, I began to ask a basic question. Who are we as men to say that our call to the priesthood is authentic, but your call as a woman is not? Who are we to reject God's call of women to the priesthood? I had to break my silence. I knew enough. And I put the word out. Whenever I was invited, which was every week, to go off and speak about the School of the Americas, they got the packaged eel. <laughs> <laughs> they began now to hear about this injustice closer to home. And I remember a turning point was going to Rome, Italy. Not Rome, New York, Rome, Italy. <laughs> and uh, to speak at a big conference of hundreds of priests and nuns about the School of the Americas, well received. And my last day at Rome, I was invited on, to, on Vatican Radio. <laughs> I to be, uh, 15 minutes live in three different languages going throughout Europe. Just, I could see the Pope's residence from Vatican Radio there in St. Peter's Square. And wow, it went really well for about 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I the school of the Americas, and, well, and I said, you know, we've got to talk about this other injustice, women in the church. And I just put it out there. There will never be justice in the Catholic Church until women can be ordained. Amen. Amen. Minute, minute, minute and a half left. When the manager walked in, he just. <laughs> <laughs> this Gregorian chant started. <laughs> and I'll never forget there were women in Vatican Radio on the staff there. They came in and said, Wow. You have time for a cup of coffee? <laughs> when I got back to Georgia, there was a message from the headquarters, and Merino headquarters, and I was reported. And I was warned a number of times after that that I had to shut up or I'm going to be in trouble. And I simply couldn't. I just, it came down really to what we call conscience. We've all been there. Our conscience is that lifelong companion, sacred, very sacred. It's our lifeline to the divine. It always urges us to do what is right, to do what is just. And when we do what is right, follow our conscience. We sleep well, we've got that inner peace, that joy, and when we don't, we're tormented. I've been there, you've been there. And I knew what I had to do. I knew that I could not be silent. And then when I was invited to the ordination ceremony of one of the many women uh, being called, Janice Severdeschinska in Lexington, Kentucky, one of our prisoners of conscience, a school teacher, called like so many to the priesthood. She invited me, hundreds gathered. I said it would be an honor to go. And I was invited to be one of the homilists, participate in the ordination. And 
It didn't take long when the letter came from the Vatican. The letter said that I had caused grave scandal in the Catholic Church. The first thought that came to mind when I read that letter from the Vatican was that when Catholics hear the word scandal, they don't think about women's ordination. <laughs> I have to remind them that in the United States alone, over 6,000 Catholic priests raped and sexually abused over 12,000 children. And not one of them at that time was excommunicated. Nor were there bishops who were aware of these horrific crimes against these children report them, they were transferred, transferred to other parishes where they continued their horrific crimes. But my letter really focused in on conscience, and I said, what you're asking of me is not possible. You are demanding that I say, lie to you, that I say that women cannot be ordained, because they said, if I did not recant, I would be kicked out of the priesthood. And I said, what you're asking me to do is to betray, to violate my conscience. And as you know, it's very sacred. They always taught us about the primacy of conscience. And I said in my letter, and two years went by, I went about my work, it's amazing. I never heard anything from them, but just four months before Pope Francis was made Pope, the letter came from Pope Benedict. He, of course, said I was causing scandal in the church and that I was now dismissed, kicked out. And that was hard, but being kicked out of the priesthood was not as hard as being kicked out of my family, my community of 40 years, 46 years, six years in the seminary and 40 years as a priest. And I just want to say I have never, many of us have gone through hard times in many different ways, but I have never experienced something like that, the rejection, the hurt, the pain. But most painful was the silence of friends told me privately they supported the ordination, support the ordination of women, but they couldn't go public. I read that quote not long ago from Dr. King. He said, you know, you will forget very easily the harshness, the meanness of your critics that you don't know. You will never forget the silence of your friends. And I was filled with a lot of anger the last two years have been dealing with a lot of anger. And sometimes it was hard to recapture that joy and hope. I used to get these joy attacks a lot. <laughs> that kind of somehow disappeared. But they're coming back, they're coming back. Because I've learned something like so many of us who have gone through crises in our lives, hurt, rejection, and what I've learned is this, what I have experienced is but a glimpse, a little glimpse of what women, people of color, and our many LGBT sisters and brothers, what they have been experiencing in the way of suffering and rejection in our churches, in our society, for centuries, for centuries. And I've only gotten a little glimpse of that. And what I've learned is that this, what I saw was a curse has turned out to be a blessing. That glimpse I'm beginning to see is a blessing, a, a great blessing. And it wasn't long after I was kicked out of the priesthood, I got an invitation from Dignity to attend their national convention and uh, I went. They gave me some kind of an award for courage. 
hurt. And when I heard their stories, these are gay and lesbian Catholics who are able to stay in the church, who have suffered so much, and kicked out of their homes, fired from their jobs, uh, exiled. And uh, but the stories I heard was just some of them that I've heard s since then. And um, I've realized that I've got to now address this issue of this church teaching that is the most cruel of all the church teachings of the Catholic Church. Certainly not allowing women to be ordained. It's a grave injustice. But if you go to the catechism of the Catholic Church and read his teaching, I'm embarrassed to even use the word that they use. They said, they, they, they state very clearly, just by being homosexual, you are dishonored. Which implies, which actually states that Somehow the millions who are born gay, lesbian, LGBT, that somehow you're different, you're lesser than others. And I can only say this is heresy. This is heresy. This is the cruelest thing I, I, I see in the Catholic Church of all these teachings. And There are so many stories, but just a couple months ago, I met this Catholic couple who loves their son, 15 years old, struggling with his sexuality. And um, he was bullied at his Catholic school. And they tried to say, son, we love you unconditionally. You know, we love you. There's no difference. You're gay, others are straight. We love you. But he was among many, especially the young people who uh, took his life and committed suicide. He simply left, you know, I can't take it anymore. And his parents left the church. And this I will never forget their words. His mom and dad said to me, they were crying, and said, you know, our church contributed, contributed to the death of our son along with society and just the ignorance of people. And I believe that. We read a lot about anti-bullying, which is so good in our high schools and places. We, we're going after the bullies. No, no, we are not going to allow you to bully others for their race, gender, sexual orientation. No. And I hate to say this, but my church, the Catholic Church, contributes, they, they're part of that bullying. I, 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 and I thought of leaving the church as so many of my friends have, many women, gay people, they just, they say to me, I couldn't take it. And I'm not there yet. I don't want to leave because I'll tell you what, I, I don't want to leave and allow these bullies to do what they're doing. I'm going to stay in like Mary Lou and so many women in the women's automation movement and also in the LGBT community, it's hard, but some are able to stay in, to reform the church, to say, I will not allow you to claim ownership of the church. Yes, even gay priests, gay bishops, they are silent. They don't want to lose their power. They don't want to lose their privileges, their great lifestyle. We are saying we are not leaving. This is not your church. We are the church. We are the church. And we are going to change those teachings that discriminate. And last, but let me just say, they're still angry, as you can tell. Many of us deal with anger. Nelson Mandela, when he left prison after 27 years, and although I read about this, not long ago when he left prison after 27 years in South Africa. 
He said, if I don't let go of my anger, I will continue to be in that prison. And I realized my anger was imprisoning me. I was still in prison. And it's getting better, and I'll tell you why. I'm filled with hope. My hope is stronger than my anger. This is why, and I want to close with this. I see it very clearly. Any movement that is rooted in love, in justice, in equality, you cannot stop. No one can stop it. Why? It is of the divine. It is of God, the creator. There were many who tried to stop the abolition of slavery, many church people. Many in my church, they couldn't do it. Many tried to stop the right of women to vote, including cardinals and bishops in my church. You know a lot about the women's suffrage movement and how long it took to uh, get that vote, the right to vote. But you know, it couldn't be stopped. And so many tried to stop, and many church people tried to stop the civil rights movement. They too failed. Why? Because it was about love, justice, and equality. And I have no doubt I'm filled with hope because I know that real soon we are going to have women ordained. We are going to have gay marriage. We're going to have LGBT equality. This racism will keep getting lesser and lesser. But for that to happen, we've got to break out of silence. Like Bishop Oscar Romero said before he was assassinated, in this struggle for peace, justice, and equality, we can all do something, and we can do it well. So let us do it well. Let us break out of silence and keep working for peace, justice, and equality. Thank you. Thank you.